With me today we have my friend Benedicia. We were discussing uh, institutionalized religion, shall we say, and how uh, it interacts with what's going on in the world. The subject came up with the Spanish Inquisition, and I confess as often as I hear about it, I'm not really that familiar with it. And I thought maybe you would have some insights to share on that period. How did such a thing happen? What exactly did happen? Well, you have to get a little bit of a background. Um, the church first ex executed for someone for heresy in the early uh, 300 ADs. As a matter really fact, early. Really early. Okay. As a matter of fact, the word heresy does not mean what it does today. The original word for heresy meant a choice of beliefs. And it had to do with the fact that there was no such thing as a large organized religion when this word was coined. What they were talking about were spiritual systems that there was a wide variety of detail that nobody worried really about. I mean, you believed, for example, in the Olympian pantheon mm -hmm. or the Roman version of it or something of that nature, and some particular god you would take as your patron god and that was the, the deity that, that you would perform the, the worships and the sacrifices and make the prayers to and so on, even though you acknowledged the rest of the pantheon, but you still sort of said, well, this God fits what I do with my life. So it was very individualized. Yeah. And so a heresy was simply a way of saying, well, this person follows um, Hera and this person follows Aphrodite and that person follows Apollo or something of that nature and that's all the word meant was that choice of who was the god you were going to follow and how you were going to do it uh, not all the, the people who followed Bacchus were Bacchanalians um, they just you know on certain special holidays for Bacchus they would go and party and it was no big deal. And then there were the ones who, who really got nuts, the Maynids. And, you know, that was their choice. But those, those were the heresies of the time. When the Christian church was beginning, they were... But referring to that time, uh, as far as the sin in them in our present time, um, perhaps the way we use the word denominations to refer to all the different... Uh, divisions within Christianity, you know, whether you're Lutheran, Episcopal, Presbyterian, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, it's more like that. That's okay. what heresy used to mean. When the Christian church first started feeling um, powerful, that it had some say when, when uh, Constantine and people like that started making Christianity a state religion, mm -hmm. then it became possible for this church to, to build even more on its own power by suppressing anyone who didn't follow that central idea, that central hierarchy. And the more people you have who believe the same thing, the stronger you get. Yes, but they have to believe the same thing. 
exactly the same. Right. The more the more rigid and regimented you get, the stronger your church becomes. And at that point, it doesn't matter how many people you have. If they all believe exactly the same thing and believe it fanatically so, you have a stronger group of people than if you've got ten times that many who all sort of follow maybe the same sort of kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's no cohesion, there's no community there. So the church exploited this idea. And but where you think, get that degree of cohesion, it seems to me it starts to very easily get very inhumane because it starts to deny all the individual qualities that make us humans. So? <laughs> Does it matter when power is most important, I suppose? Well, if you're, it, it's not even a matter of power. I'm sure a lot of these people really thought that they knew better than all of these other people. And by saying, you will believe this, and you will do this, and you will say that, if you will do all this, you will go to heaven. We can promise you this. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's, it's coincidental to a certain extent that they are also building their own power. But they are also building this sense of community, which makes the whole group strong. Mm. Okay, so there's both sides of that coin. You're also and you're a building, sense of a sense of community does feel good. Yeah, you are building that that individual power for certain people in the hierarchy, but they wouldn't have power if, in the first place, the people in the community didn't let them have it. You know, if you've got somebody who sits up and says, "I am king," and everybody else in the room laughs at him, this guy is never going to have any power. Mm -hmm. But if you have a priest who sits up there and says, I'm bishop, and everybody says, oh, yeah, <laughs> okay, then you've just given this person power. And then the tighter the community is, the more power that individual has. So everything just kept snowballing into the Middle Ages? Yeah. And as a matter of fact, one of the heresies that the church persecuted most strongly was a heresy that stated that there was no need for a hierarchy of any kind. If you wanted to approach the deity, you approached him on your own. And there was no need for priests and archbishops and cardinals and popes and all the rest of it. And the people who started this particular belief were a bunch of lay preachers who would travel from town to town begging and preaching this particular thought. And the church, of course, got terribly upset. It was very antithetical to what they were doing. Sure, because they hadn't asked permission of the pope to be preachers, they hadn't gotten ordained, and they weren't contributing to the church. Furthermore, they're encouraging other people not to. Exactly. This is bad. So this is one of the, the heresies that Pope Gregory the IX in 1233 decided that he was going to finish suppressing. They'd been suppressing them all along since the, the 300 AD period. Um, but he decided, you know, those and the Albigensians and a bunch of other people, we're going to do away with them now. So he set up the Inquisition. And this was a church-wide Inquisition. What exactly was the Inquisition? Okay, the original Inquisition was that um, certain orders of ordained priests who were traveling types rather than parishioner types, mm -hmm. would travel from town to town questioning people on their beliefs, questioning people on what they thought other people's beliefs were. And anyone who was accused of not following strict church doctrine would be examined by these traveling priests. And if they were found guilty of the way they changed the word heresy, then they would be allowed to recant at which point they would lose all their property and have to make a pilgr pilgrimage to Rome, come back home and start over again if they recanted. If they didn't recant, then they would be tortured, they would be burned at the stake, and all sorts of horrible mm. things. And unfortunately for certain people, it became a great way to accumulate all kinds of wealth. Because they would get the wealth of whoever they accused. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why women became such a popular target. Because at the time, women were allowed to have lands and property and wealth in their own names. Mm. 
But not since that time? That's, that's about the beginning of the period where you start seeing women becoming more under the law, property rather than partners. Mm. So you see a degeneration of, of that kind of a relationship. So these there. clerics are really traveling judges who are accountable mm -hmm. to no one. They're, they're accountable to the Pope. And they actually, the, 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 the clerics don't perform the executions themselves. Once they have either gotten the, the um, accused to recant or reached a point where they know they're not going to recant, then they are turned over to town authorities and put to death. And boy, were they inventive. Ugh. I found a book that's got some pictures from the time. It is grisly. You don't even want to know some of this stuff. But um, apparently things got really bad in Spain. Um, and in 14, it was 79, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella of Columbus fame decided that um, the heresies that they were having to deal with were just tearing their country apart. Well, they had a slightly different problem. It wasn't an internal conflict as the Albigensians and the Cathars and, and all those other people were. This was the problem of, in Spain, the Moors and the Jews had been forced to become Christian. Mm -hmm. Not just, well, you want to be a Christian, don't you? It'll give you a lot more power and rights and everything. This was, you are going to be a Christian, right? <laughs> and they, you know, thumb screws and racks and, and wheels and all the rest of the stuff. And uh, I don't know, faced with somebody ripping off my toes one at a time with no anesthetic, I think I'd say whatever words they wanted me to say. I wouldn't necessarily believe it in my own heart, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, mutilation has never struck me as a particularly fun occupation. Don't imagine it would strike anybody as fun, but... Yeah. Well, at the time, um, the Dominicans and the Franciscans were fairly new orders, and the Dominicans in particular, who took and still do take great pride in calling themselves the Hounds of God, um, were both of them very scholarly orders, very much into what does the church believe in detail, down to the last comma, the last period. Hmm. What is it that the church believes? And therefore, if you deviate from that, the least amount, you're a heretic. And we mustn't allow that. This is bad. But if you create an entirely closed, completely defined system of belief, there's no place to grow. What's your point? <laughs> they weren't concerned about that. <laughs> no. They were worried about one thing. If everybody believes what the church says, absolutely, then all of these people go to heaven. If you deviate, there's a chance you won't. And if somebody misteaches you, not only do you not go to heaven, but the person who mistaught you won't go to heaven. That means that the teachers have to be dead accurate as to what they're teaching. Because it's it not just... It sounds like the absolute extreme of narrow-mindedness. Not to them. What they were trying well, to do... Of course not to them. Yeah, but what they were trying to do was define precisely so that there would be no argument. I mean, for you know, look at the flip side of it. Communities that had large organized religions, for example, early Rome. Okay, granted everybody paid a certain amount of homage to the entire pantheon, but you'd actually have brawls in the streets over whether Aphrodite or Mars were, or excuse me, Venus or Mars, was um, the better god to follow. Hmm. There wasn't even a decent amount of acceptance there either then. Not really. And even among the ranks of those who worshipped or followed one of the particular deities, you'd have arguments over whether uh, Venus preferred fresh flowers or fresh fruits or um, people making love on the front porch of the temple or what. And you'd have, you'd have street brawls over that. So, you know, you've got both sides of the coin as far as this goes. But the church, as far as it was concerned, there were certain heresies that were so dangerous to the continuation of Christianity that they could not be allowed to have any followers at all. 
Hmm. Now, the Albigensians would have wiped themselves out by themselves if they'd been left alone, but that wasn't good enough for the church. The Albigensians... They were the, ones, they were the ones who believed that the material world was absolutely evil and that everything that you could do to divorce yourself from the material world was a good thing. So they would refuse to eat, they wouldn't have children, no marriage. They, had, they were in their last generation, basically. <laughs> yeah, but they were always recruiting. Hmm. And since it was the easiest place to recruit from, because most of their other beliefs were along Christian lines, hmm. since mostly they recruited from the Christian church, the Christian church was not amused by this. I would have thought that the best uh, strategy against it would just be to educate the people that this is not a workable system. Without a printing press, that's really difficult. Okay, you have to, one of the statistics that really blew me away when I found out, before the invention of the printing press, there were less than half a million books in all of Europe. Within 10 years of the invention of the printing press, there were five million books. 10 times that. Yeah. And that's just in 10 years. And that's not from the date that the printing press became a commercial proposition. It's from the date that Gutenberg said, I got an idea. Let's see if it works. Well, and that's a press that you print one page at a time. Right. It's not the printing presses we have today. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you don't, that isn't the kind of printing press most people use anymore. It's all computer setup. Mm -hmm. Is it even faster than that? Oh, yeah. I, you and I with the right computer, and it doesn't even cost that much. You and I could, in one year, match the output of Europe before the invention of the printing press. Hmm. Two people? Yeah. Goodness. All by ourselves. And well, in any case, to get back to this. Yeah. So. The Inquisition. The Inquisition so was. Basically a, started around 1200 or so? Right. That was Inquisition throughout all of Europe, throughout all of Christendom, I should say, since Christendom had traveled much mm -hmm. farther than Europe by that point. But the idea was if we're going to have a church and call it the Christian church, the Catholic religion, then whether you go to Rome or London or Moscow or wherever, the New World for that matter in a few years, if you walk into a Catholic church, no matter where you are, you should know that you're in a Catholic church. This was their idea. Mm -hmm. So that no matter where you went in the world, the mass was still the same language. The entire ritual of the mass was identical from place to place. You come up with a rubber stamp and smack it on top of everyone. Mm -hmm. Because that way you know that everyone is following the same path. And of course we all know that being the same is good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you have to understand, to you and I in 20th century America, that's kind of a, ooh, who wants to do that? That's no fun. Mm -hmm. But at that time and place, the world is a very frightening place. There, you know, what weather prediction they could do for Pete's sakes with some farmer walking out in his field and going, oh, it might rain tomorrow. And that's about as good as it got. Mm -hmm. And medicine? Well, if you sucked on a, on a willow twig when you had a headache, the headache would go away. Um, if you wanted to cut somebody's leg off, um, you got four strong people to hold them down while you took your hacksaw and did it. You know, this, this is the time, it's a, it's a very frightening, very unpredictable time and place. So for a lot of people, having a religion that promised you paradise when mm -hmm. you died, if you followed the rules, that's very comforting to have, to know that no matter if you traveled, if you were one of the few, the very few, who traveled more than two miles from your birthplace, to know that you could still walk into a Christian church and not be unfamiliar with it. 
that was very comforting, that felt good. I suppose there's no way really to understand the Spanish Inquisition without understanding in detail uh, the world in which it took place. Sure. Because again, you've reached a point where the world has become even more frightening. Because not only is it unpredictable, but it's getting bigger. Mm -hmm. um, it's just previous to the, to the discovery of the new world that you start having people get, having contact with China and Japan and India directly, not through a series mm -hmm. of traders. And that would probably be very unsettling as well. Sure. Because suddenly they're colliding with cultures that are radically different from anything they've ever seen. They, they've never had contact with before. It's not just vaguely unfamiliar. It is totally alien. And Marco Polo is in this period, people like that. Mm -hmm. And gunpowder is being brought back. Not just noodles and things, but scary stuff like gunpowder is being brought back. Not good stuff like silk, but other things, diseases and things too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the world is a frightening place, so if there's one thing that you can count on, no matter where you go, that's a very comforting thing. How did this all come to a head, and how did it end then? Well, the Inquisition was officially disbanded in 1820. 1820. 1820. Yeah. Not 600 years? Yeah. Six good heavens. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, it, it actually, the last 50 years or so, it was not really considered a force. Hmm. But during the Spanish Inquisition, you had both the Moors and the Jews in Spain, many of whom had been forcibly converted to Christianity, which meant they weren't really probably, who were also within their own Jewish and Moorish communities, extremely powerful groups and individuals. I mean, if you look at the records of the time, because Christians were not allowed to make loans or to do certain kinds of merchanting, they had to allow the Jews to do this. And the Moors, who were all non-Christians, who therefore didn't have to follow the Christian mm -hmm. ideals. and. When the Italians started taking all of this over, they didn't need the Jews and the Moors anymore. So, Which was their death knell. Mm -hmm. Because by then, these two communities had developed great amounts of wealth because they were careful, they were logical, their own religions preached um, the goodness of collection of knowledge and the use of it. The Moors in particular if you look at most of the bases of our culture today, as far as, as anything scientific goes, you don't trace it back to European tradition, you trace it back to Moorish tradition. Hmm. Even our counting system comes from the Moors. The way we draw our symbols for one and two and three and four, all of that, it's all Moorish. Hmm. We dropped the, the Roman version because it was so darned unwieldy. But our, our ideas about science, our ideas about how to find out about something, all of this comes from the Moorish and the Jewish traditions. And to have these people who are forcibly con converted to Christianity, who are still powers within the Christian community of Spain, when they are no longer ducks, then. sure, when they are no longer necessary because of their ties with the with the banking and merchanting communities, because now Italy has taken those over, right? Then they're no longer necessary, and as a matter of fact, they become a liability. Because what if they start demanding protection from the Italian communities? Then you wind up uh, between a rock and a hard place. Sure. Economically, you want to answer one, but theologically, you have to answer the other. Sure. And besides, Ferdinand and Elisabella uh, had a very empty treasury. And uh, considering how, in my opinion, how they wasted a lot of it, um, this becomes a very difficult thing. I mean, the, you know, there are a lot of people, I'm sure, who are going to watch this and who are going to jump up and down in their living rooms and have hissy fits. 
because the way they see the Spanish Inquisition and the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella, this is all a good time. Well, I kind of think that, that any group that says, well, if you recant and really embrace Christianity without my forcing you to, you can keep your life, but everything else is forfeit. Or if you don't recant, we'll take your life too after we've done horrible things to you. Um, yeah, I'd say that's a rock and a hard place. <laughs> and I really wouldn't want to have to make the choice. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the, as far as I'm concerned, as far as a lot of people are concerned, the Spanish Inquisition is one of those things that you try not to think about much. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of nasty stuff that went on. They, it started out for good reasons. Well, Grant, but, but I think it is important that we remember the nasty stuff in life as well. Sure. You know, the, the overused quote that those who don't know the mistakes of the past are destined to repeat them. If you look at from the time we started having inquisitions and persecutions for heresy, if you look at what the meaning of the word is today, um, look at what happened in Hollywood for crying out loud with, uh, what's his name, McCarthy? Mm -hmm. The whole era of McCarthy? Is sure. A smaller version of the same thing? It was an inquisition. The only difference was, granted, these people weren't tortured and, and put to death by being flung onto fires and things, but in, a, in other ways, I mean, psychologically and emotionally, these people were flayed, they were tortured, they were burned, they were destroyed. Um, there are people whose works um, we admire no end today, who after a certain period, on the simple accusation, no trial, no chance for acquittal, on the simple accusation that they might have some relationship to some group that might not quite be as American as certain people think it should be, they lost everything. That's ridiculous. Oh, it is. But there's nothing that says it can't happen again. Look at We're out of time, unfortunately. It's been really interesting, though. Um, but uh, We could talk for hours about these things. Oh, yes. Yeah, I guess that's one of the problems with our show. We just have this little window to touch on things and give everyone something to think about. But uh, well, even if there's no end angry, to discussing it. If, even if people get angry and turn it off, I hope they heard enough that something sticks yeah. and makes them think. Or at the very least, be a little more aware to what's going on in their own lives. Oh, I, I can't remember where the line comes from, but it, there's some character, a very recent movie, where he says something about, um, I've been thinking, and his friend turns and says, that's a dangerous pastime. <laughs> I suppose <Yeah>. so. <laughs> but... Uh, but Maybe that's where I live a very risky life. Yeah, well, I, I think that's better than being brainless all the time. Mm -hmm.